My father made it his mission to raise me as an independent woman. He was also a product of his times, a depression baby who had a domineering father and subservient mother. And so his way of instilling resilience was unorthodox at best. In order to be a strong, successful woman in this world, you can't just be good, you gotta be great. Dad, I got a 98 on my math test. Why didn't you get 100? He was unyieldingly hard on me. His expectations often unreasonable. But in my childhood, the unreasonable went unquestioned because it was all I ever knew. These expectations created a fierce sense of independence. At the age of eight, on Saturday mornings, I would pack myself a lunch, put the leash on Blitz, my horse-sized Alaskan Malmute dog, and leave the house yelling up the stairs, bye, see you for dinner, and off I'd go hiking in the woods for the day. In a world before cell phones, before milk carton mug shots, where free range parenting meant kids left the house only to return when the street lights turned on. My dad valued my insight, fostered my curiosity. He himself being a self-made man, running his own multi-million dollar chemical company he had resurrected from the ashes of bankruptcy. He was the first in his family to go to college, majoring in physics at a time the field was just exploring atomic energy. When I told him that my high school physics teacher had dismissed me with an unironic, don't worry, girls can't do physics. He responded by not only helping me, but tutoring all of my girlfriends in after school study sessions. For as supportive as my dad was, his own toxic childhood reared its ugly head in unexpected moments. In one breath, dad would have a nuanced political conversation with me, and in the next, rage at my mother for buying the expensive celery. <laughs> he would rely on me to help him assemble the new barbecue that arrived in a million pieces, and in the, in the next breath, berate mom for chairing volunteer organizations when he expected her to stay home with him to watch the eight o'clock movie instead. He built me up while simultaneously knocking her down. As a result, I also learned to become my mom's advocate. Friday nights, for example, were a time to go out as a, to dinner as a family. And mom knew that if I suggested a place, dad would think it was a great idea. But if she had the same idea, it would be immediately dismissed. Part expediency, part protecting mom, I learned to be the voice for the two of us. So it was no surprise that when it came time to go to college and become independent, I wanted to go far away, as far as I could. Distancing myself had always been my main mode of survival. When the acceptance letters came in, I had two viable choices, San Diego or Boston. I don't have to tell you which one I wanted, but it might come as a surprise that mom also encouraged me to go out of state. She like my dad, was the first in her family to go to college. But she lived at home, cooked dinners while her parents were at work, and worked summers in order to pay her own tuition. Yes, I might have been her voice at home, but outside dad's world, she was an accomplished musician, educator, conductor, philanthropist. Her constant support always guided me in ways to pursue bigger and bigger dreams, dreams beyond her own reach. She is the true source of my strength. But dad, dad was the whetstone I used to sharpen my strength into action. Dad launched an aggressive campaign to convince me to stay in state. He started with the bribe. I'll buy you a car if you go to San Diego. <laughs> what he didn't understand is that under his tutelage, I had the refined, critical eye that could sniff out bullshit. His independent thinker 
rebelled against the very source of that independence. And I don't think he was prepared for how resolute I could be. He, in turn, escalated his tactics, resorting to emotional blackmail. You won't fit in if you go back east. They're more refined. You'll never succeed. They're posh and you're uncouth. That backfired even more because I had also learned from him, no less, to fight harder whenever I was told I can't. I held firm and accepted the offer to attend BU sight unseen. And dad reluctantly accepted that his baby girl was going to move to the East Coast, at least until his anger exploded. My parents decided they would fly out with me a week before orientation to help me move in, do a bit of sightseeing in a part of the country none of us had ever experienced. The night before we deciding what needed to come middle of packing, looking around my childhood bedroom, deciding what needed to come with me in this new chapter, as I wouldn't be home until Christmas. I was carefully putting my things into a giant square suitcase that we had fondly nicknamed the amoeba because it had several zippers that would allow it to expand to seemingly endless capacity. My room was becoming more and more barren as item after item was packed neatly away in the amoeba. Mom hovered, clearly emotional, clearly wanting to help. Dad kept his distance. Then mom, who always seemed to be the match to his powder keg, brought me a small box of laundry detergent. And my dad erupted in blind rage. She's packed enough. Don't you think they have goddamn laundry detergent there? Do you want me to break my back schlepping this thing down to the car? And with that, he grabbed the neatly, nearly packed, unzipped amoeba containing what would sustain me for the next few months, heaved it down the stairs, clunk, 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 opened the front door, and with superhuman strength, hurled it and all its contents onto the front lawn, closed the door, and went to bed. Clearly, his back was not the issue. After I was certain his rage had subsided, I quietly turned on the porch light and began the slow process of retrieving all my belongings from the darkened corners of the lawn, the ivy, the hedges, the driveway. After I had scoured the perimeter of the yard and had neatly repacked the amoeba, I zipped it, laced it inside the front hall, and without saying a word, went to bed. The next morning, as was typical after these outbursts, we cheerfully ate breakfast as if nothing had happened. After clearing the table, I sat on the red stair-stepped stool, my usual perch in the kitchen, while mom finished washing the dishes. Her back was to me, and she suddenly froze, frying pan in hand. Her shoulders began to shake with silent sobs that interrupted our comfortable routine. This made no sense. We were leaving for a week-long family trip before even thinking about moving me into the dorm. And what was more, none of us ever showed feelings, let alone cried in front of each other. What's wrong, Mom? Without looking up from the pan in the sink, her back still to me, she quietly said, don't leave me. Don't leave me alone with your father. I was stunned. Conversations with my mom only skirted the surface of chores, activities, schedules, events. Talking about feelings was unthinkable. So I don't know if it was because I wanted to abruptly change the topic or if I was so close to freedom that I knew I could speak candidly. But if I'm honest, I think my next words were a release of years of resentment for having to fight her battles alongside mine. Whatever the reason, without thinking, without missing a beat, 
I responded flatly, you married him, not me. And then I left the kitchen feeling a mix of guilt and relief. In the car to LAX, my mother sat in the passenger seat, still silently crying the entire hour long drive. My father, in a clumsy attempt to stop the uncomfortable outburst of emotion, chided her with the fact that we were gonna spend a whole week together trying to overpower her emotions with logic. As I was skilled in removing myself, I tuned it all out, focusing instead on the tall telephone poles and palm trees that appeared to stand still as the rest of the scenery whizzed by in a blur. The rest of that week was also a blur as we settled back into our regular rhythm. We toured historic Boston, visited family friends, and navigated our way all around an unfamiliar campus, all of which I only remember from looking at family photo albums. The only clear moment from that week is the final goodbye in my newly furnished dorm room. Moments before my parents' departure and just after the amoeba had shrunk to a size that could disappear under an extra long twin bed. Mom and dad were standing in my room, my mom straightening the pillows on my bed, my dad in the doorway silently looking at the posters on the wall. He hugged me with a quiet, almost apologetic, I'm proud of you. And then turned to the elevator just outside my room. Mom lingered as if she were taking a mental picture of my new home and hugged me one last time and before letting go said softly, I never could have done this at your age. It took another 10 years before I could confront my dad finding the courage to name the lifetime of feelings we were expected to ignore and suppress. But once those feelings were unpacked, they poured down from my face, from a bottomless source, releasing an entire childhood in an endless flood of tears. My dad's reaction, I thought you were stronger than this. I thought I taught you better. It makes me sad that my dad equates strength with stoicism. Strength is my mother's unexpected vulnerability as she cried silent tears down the kitchen sink, tears she spent years suppressing in order to survive the day to day. Strength is feeling the feelings, naming the feelings, and then freeing those feelings. My mom's strength was cloaked in a veneer of survival. But when she was faced with the reality that I was leaving and she had to stand up for herself, she found her voice, setting me on my own path to develop mine. Independence, strength. These are gifts my parents gave me, albeit in often unwanted packages. I don't strive for the unattainable perfection and greatness my dad so naively thought a successful woman needed. I don't suppress my feelings and excuse away bad behavior as my mom did when I was young. Instead, I know when to bend and not be broken and when to stand up when the world swirls like those trees I saw outside the car window. My childhood resentment transformed into an appreciation of the many layers of experience I've accumulated. Layers that, upon reflection, I've, I've carefully packed away or discarded completely. I now understand there's more to life than just survival, much more than what can be crammed into the big blue amoeba. <laughs>